Today, I want to go over a concept that we really need to beef up about. And let me tell you up front, this is one you're going to want to listen to. If not for a need you have, maybe for a neighbor or a family member. Work has rules. Companies are not acting wisely or nicely. They're not playing fair. And in fact, there are opportunities for individuals to stand up for them. And I will tell you, the discrimination all the way down the line happens even within these organizations. But the more you know, the more ropes you learn to skip and the more ropes you learn to jump. So I, I really encourage a, a quick listen here that will delve deep into the process and the realization of what actually occurs and the next steps. Okay, so I'm looking from a California perspective, and of course, work has rules, as I've stated, and there are labor departments set up in order to protect individuals in this country, in this state, and around the world. And in Silicon Valley, we've especially needed it because of the culture that has risen, where if you're not my drinking buddy, I'm not going to hire you culture within Silicon Valley high tech, you get aged out really fast. Or if you're a woman on a male engineering team, it doesn't go that well for promotions. You just have to be grateful that you squeezed in the door. Or if you happen to be a US citizen and not an H-1B visa holder, good luck. You didn't even make it in the door. So there's a lot of challenges we're seeing in the system. What are the sources that people have to protect them? Well, let's take a look at this. There's two primary and a third we're going to look at today and also the process within that. This first one that I have on the screen here is DFEH. This is Department of Fair Employment of Housing. Every state has their own version of what this is. On the screen, it's got a place to file a complaint, obtain a right to sue letter, pay data reporting, dispute resolution, uh, which is a mediation, resources, legal information, and search. So the, the ta tablet is laid out for you, and we'll go into more detail in a minute. The second organization we're going to take a look into is US EEOC. Now, this is um, federal, where the other one is basic state. However, these employees sit within each state. They are funded federally but really play by each state rules. The um, resolutions that they have are slightly different, but there's pretty much overlap. In fact, if you file with DFEH, EEOC doesn't take it. They just file that it's been filed and EEOC, then DFEH doesn't take it. They just uh, check a box. And quite honestly, having been a, a federal employee myself and worked alongside, right away you can see which individuals are professionals, diligent, and care about not just their numbers, but about you as an individual being resolved. And within minutes, you're going to know which, which person on the spectrum you got. And there's a very high churn because the, the pay is not that great. In fact, as I've shopped around with attorneys, I've learned that if there is an attorney with the EEOC or with the DFEH, you can guarantee they probably went to law school, but they may not have passed the bar yet or ever and or they're just not good in their career and this is where they they landed now again you know there's always a a, a saying that hey teachers teach because they can't do you always have exceptional lawyers that pop up in different organizations because they want to give but we haven't seen that in california a long time in either of these two agencies so we'll dig more into that and then the third inter um, group that we have here is dlse and it's department of labor dol and yet it's always put as D-I-R. They, they themselves in their verbiage aren't in alignment. But anyways, this is essentially the Department of Labor. And so that'll be the, the third agency that, that we look at on that level. So let's go ahead and start back here. So back in, and it would have been about this period of time, this book was written in 1994, and I am not recommending this book, but I was looking up the term work is a contact sport, and this said life is a contact sport, so I went ahead and pulled it up. Again, not recommending it, not, not, I've just never read it, I don't know, but the concept is that in a workplace, sometimes it comes down to you got to keep looking to see if anybody's stabbing you in the back, you got to duck and swing and run, kind of that old a song by Kenny Rogers, know when to hold him, know when to fold him, know when to walk away, and know when to run. That's what the boardroom is like. That's what the sales teams are like. And that's what the engineering departments have become like. As fighting for promotions comes from the end, even those making millions of dollars a year will fight just for the title. 
work has become a contact sport. And again, this is a revelation that I had back in the early 90s. Here we are, 2021, if you can even believe that's a year, and we are still working like children in the workforce, where it's a pyramid scheme, all the peons are at the bottom, you slowly get tapered, slow, um, tapered towards the middle more and more at the upper, and then you've got one individual calling the shots from the beginning, who's making thousands of times more money than the other individuals, and yet their job is to rule over the people. So here, let's go ahead and start with DFEH, Department of Fair Employment and Housing. I'm not going to go down the housing path because I haven't experienced that, but I will talk about what I know in the employment arena. And I started out as a mediator with Santa Clara County in this area. So I have um, kind of a, a, a different view of this. But as of March 24th, 2021, uh, the statement here from their site uh, was, Department of Fair Employment and Housing is a state agency charged with enforcing California's civil rights laws. So these are not criminal at all. This is a, something was done, we need it resolved. The mission of this DFEH is protect protect the people of California from unlawful discrimination in employment, housing, businesses, and state-funded programs, and from bias-motivated violence and human trafficking. Now, interesting that that last one got thrown in there. Now, I want to point out as well that if you are a federal employee, you cannot use DFEH and you can't use a normal route for EEOC. There's a different route for federal employees within the EEOC program. And let me tell you, it's a federal employee that guides the program, a federal employee who stands as judge, but they're all actually not judge. I think they're called hearing officers or administrative officers, something on that level. They're not judges. And if they rule too much in one direction, they don't have their federal jobs anymore. So they go up against the federal employee that was wronged, which in the uh, right around 2010, 2011, there were over 700,000 federal employee complaints. Um, and you know, you always get people who just complain to complain. But when you got that high of a number, you better believe there's something wrong in the system. And that circle when I was um, at, in the federal government, and there's a lot wrong in the system today bubbling out of that. So you know we've got challenges all along the way. You can't have somebody act one way in one business situation, expect them to be different in another. We're seeing them show their faces here. You believe it wasn't born now, it's come up all along. So this is Department of Fair Employment and Housing. EEOC I pulled up and it said em Equal Employment Opportunity Commission enforces laws that make discrimination illegal in the workplace. So again, work has rules. The commission oversees all types of work situations, including hiring, firing, promotions, harassment, training, wages, and benefits. Now, it's interesting, as I pulled this up, we've got one right here on the left. Union boss knew about this particular type of, of a protected activity. And you know what he did? He demoted the accuser rather than, and this happens all the time. We'll, we'll look at this later in here, but victims are all often victimized more than once and rather than an employer handling the issue because mostly the aggressor is somebody at a higher pay salary a supervisor somebody with more um, prestige in the company and they're always believed before the minimum worker now i'll tell you when i was 16 years old now you'd have to be 18 but at 16 years old i got my very first formal job and i worked for a bank and i worked there for seven years and that job taught me a lot because as everybody came in to cash their paychecks, because this is really uh, before direct deposit. And uh, in fact, I was standing there when the first ATM went into our county. Uh, we actually started writing on logs um, until the computers came in. Yeah, it was the Stone Ages. Um, but what I learned is as people came in with their paychecks, I would get to see the dollar amount of their paycheck, I would get to see what they looked like, and I'd have a brief conversation as I was making the transaction, whether depositing or cashing. Um, often, the lower the paycheck, it was cash, the higher the paycheck, it was deposited, you know, there's different data points you pick up. Uh, the taller and fairer skin the individual was directly impacted the dollar amount on the paycheck, which was higher than shorter um, 
darker individuals. This was very consistent. And also those who you could tell in a day's work literally earned every single penny they had probably no no real breaks maybe sitting down for 10 minutes here and there but really sitting and talking to a wife or handling another task or going golfing because that's required that did not happen for the individuals that were scraping by a minimum wage so which must have been probably around five bucks an hour back then versus those individuals who uh you know, they, they kind of got to work when they wanted to. They rolled out of there when they wanted to. They had plenty of time to pick up their wife and their kids and go play soccer, coach soccer teams. Their salaries were quite a bit higher. So I learned early on, the more you make, the less you actually have to do. And somebody say, well, wait a minute, but they've got taken out a lot of education to get themselves higher. Well, as we know, often those in the highest levels do not go the same route that you and I do. In fact, their trust fund and or somewhere along that path, they go through private schools, they are introduced into jobs, they never really go for an interview process and heaven forbid they should ever have anybody make a resume for them. They're just introduced in and the, the opening is created and the waters part and now they're making $400,000 a year. As we saw with Hillary Clinton a few years ago who had a, a um, board position on in a for a company in New York, and that was just one example of the collection of board positions that which she had. Do you think she earned that more than an individual who had worked at that company for let's say 10, 20 years, knew all the insides and outs, and had great ideas to pull it forward? Uh, no, certainly not. And yet that person was probably making about forty thousand dollars a year versus four hundred thousand. So let's continue here. Um, and then um, I, I'm not sure why the EDD one came up. It was within Department of Labor, but it didn't come up with the details I was looking for here. Um, and again, each state has one and there is a federal as well, um, but they usually do oversight, I believe. I don't think they get involved in the, the state level claims. And here's a note that um, in this case, victims shouldn't pay twice, but you know they do. Even if um, something happens, you know to keep your head down and keep your mouth shut. We all know that. However, when it raises to the level that an individual is actually removed from their position or suffering so much that they cannot do their job, and it would be a point that they will probably get removed anyways, some point somebody has to cross that line and speak out. And in most cases, when an individual speaks out, they are terminated anyways. They are not protected. They are often said that they're not believed, but they are believed enough that the organization wants to get rid of them. And yet the other individual is often, as I saw over the last two years in a, in a case I was involved in, the, the female was uh, literally removed from an HQ job, removed title, removed pay, and stuck outside by a gate. That is right, outside by a gate in an area the company called a prison yard in order to watch a gate that rarely opened or moved or anybody went in and out of. Meanwhile, the two supervisors who devised this plan and the actions of discrimination and harassment that led up to that were actually promoted in pay and title within 60 days of this happening to this individual. And then, of course, as, as time went on, the organization realized that the individual had in fact filed a, a protection claim. So what did the company do? They fired her. And so in this case, the victim was, was um, just punched down time and time again. And in, and then the fourth level in this case, which would normally be called, you know, the second after removal from the job, is that when you go to try and find another job, companies know publicly who has filed charges and who has not. So you've got to be aware that if you're going to go into a public situation, all that data that you put forward is forward, is, is, um, is public. So your address, your name, any of the documents included in there, your email, your tracking, all of that becomes public record. And so anybody who stands up for themselves because they've been victimized or even think they may have been victimized is now on another list. And I don't know uh, if they're, they're formed on a list that employers can search to see whether or not this person is a problem maker. 
And who is the troublemaker? The individual who stands up for themselves or the individual who did the victimizing? And yet there's not a list for that unless it gets into a cr criminal proceeding. So they are protected. If we move over here, there's policy for uh, discrimination, harassment, and retaliation within a DFEH. And, um, and in a few pages, we're gonna go into the policy around that. Uh, EEOC also has members of protected classes and protected activities that people may participate in. So here it says applicants, employees, and former. So even applying to a job, if you apply to a job as one of my, um, my cases entailed, an employee, a, um, a job applicant applied to a job. The prospective employer asked to see uh, a driver's license um, and the individual was wise enough to say, I don't think you wanna see that. I am an older individual. And if in fact you have that in your records and you choose not to hire me, that may not look fondly. Is there another piece of document I could provide to you to establish who I am? And they went ahead and demanded it anyways, and then actually responded back, you are too old. And so this case moved forward and this individual never, never got a job with those people, but immediately filed with the documentation and a very large settlement was paid out. And you might say, that's not fair, they didn't do anything. Well, the difference is in this case, they got caught and there are rules and the employer went ahead and and followed and did at least kind of what's right. The bottom line is the person did not actually want a settlement at all. She just wanted an opportunity for a fair interview. And that's correct. She didn't push for a job either. She just kept saying, please give me a fair interview. That's all I want. And they absolutely refused. So the payout happened. But let's look at this. So applicants, employees, former employees are protected from employee discrimination based on race, color, religion, um, gender here, it, they keep changing that term, but it really means gender, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And then also national origin, age, 40 or over is a protected class. So somehow we decided that from 39 to 40, you're now too old to work and you gotta stand up for yourself. Disability and genetic information, including family medical history, Applicants, employees, and former employees are also protected from retaliation, which is a level of punishment for filing a charge or a complaint of discrimination or participating in a discrimination investigation. So maybe somebody else at work had a complaint and HR department gave your name and rather th than um, saying I won't comply, you went ahead and complied as is the law. And then they can often retaliate and discriminate there too. And so that is a protected activity. Uh, so I pulled this up to get um, protected classes and the information is not as forthcoming. So then I just went ahead and moved right on back into these sites. So again, this is right here at dfeh.ca.gov. This is the California version of Department of Fair Employment of Housing. And there's quite a bit of information on this site, but I will tell you they are quite a small agency. I don't know the number of employees uh, right now. Um, they don't move very quick. They're not the sharpest tools in the shed. You know, I really like to give the highlights and the positive of, um, of, of different organizations and agencies. It's just not really a strong one. In fact, in 2019, they took in 22,000 cases in California. So that means 22,000 individuals in California felt that on some level, they had been fairly discriminated against and or uh, violated the work has rule notion. And out of those 22,000 cases, I don't know how many went to investigation and I'll go through the process of what that means, but a percentage of those went to investigation. And then out of those four, one, two, three, four out of 22,000 complaints in one in the largest populated state in the union, four went on to file a suit. That's it, no more. It's a disgrace. 
So let's go ahead while we're here at DFEH, I want to pause and go a little bit into the process of what happens. Um, so if you have a complaint in the workplace, this goes through how to file a complaint. It's right on here. And if you're a, a, a company, how to respond to a complaint. Um, if you want to check the complaint status, it's here, CCRS and report discriminate at ads and apps. So what we see is if you were going to go ahead and hire somebody, you had to provide evidence that in fact you were fairly posting the job so that you would collect a fair pool of people to apply. So for instance, if you wanted um, to hire lifeguards for your pool, you couldn't just post the job application in the locker room at a, at a I don't know, football stadium that only allows boys in the, in the changing locker room you'd have to show that you were posting it in that location and for both the girls and the boys. Well, we could say now, of course, we don't do that because we, we don't post on walls and bulletin boards. Well, even one step worse than that are sites like Indeed or Monster or LinkedIn, where when somebody wants to post a job to go out to individuals, either uh, directly seen as advertisements or as direct messages into their message feed or emails, you have to pay for that service. And the way you pay for that is you figure what demographics you want to target. So you will say what area of the country, maybe what state, what city, what zip code. Um, you can even say what um, income or financial status that that person might be for come. You can put what schools that they're from. You can put their age range, which is discrimination. You can put whether or not you're looking for males or females, discrimination. You can put, but anyways, you target exactly what you want. Because if it's really broad, you have to pay more for the more people to look at it. So you're winding it down. So if you get into companies like in Silicon Valley, maybe something with autonomous vehicles, Primarily, those jobs are targeting individuals solely a male in a specific age range. And yet, when you go through the interview process, they, they might even feign um, ignorance that there's only a few girls coming here, so they don't have as many to promote, that some promotions aren't as wide. Well, let's back up. How many people saw your ads? Did you directly advertise to a broadest, the broadest group in a fair manner when you did the interview process then? Was it fair and complete? Once you pulled people in, did you offer the same training on both tracks, or did you tap the men for on the job training that went above and beyond that and then promoted them because they had the additional training and yet the people sitting right next to them, the females perhaps, uh, did not get that on the job opportunity. So didn't end up with the promotion because they weren't chosen uh, because they're a female and they, they, they shouldn't really be around cars um, is a comment that I heard quite a bit. Um, it, now, so this is the complaint process. And what happens is so an employee would go ahead and, and file a complaint. After a period of time, at this point, it's usually a few months, somebody from DFEH would contact the individual who filed the complaint. And they'll ask them, uh, kind of like an interview, normally it's between 60 and 90 minutes, and they'll ask them a broader range of questions around the circumstances of what happened, whether or not there were any witnesses, whether or not there's any documentation. Um, and, and so these, this is the direction they're going to go. They're going to then do a summary based on that information. And you know at this point whether or not you have a chance as to whether or not the individual knows anything about the working world, if they um, are clear on the questions that they're asking. And then when they draft the summary that you've discussed with them and they present it back to you to sign, whether or not it even reflects what you had discussed. In many cases, the individuals are not even close to the conversation that you had, uh, dates and, um, and factual events, um, or the facts of the case can actually, actually be off quite a bit, as I've seen on many cases. So, so you um, file a complaint, somebody contacts you, they do a quick interview. If they deem that, that this case can go to investigation, then they'll, they'll create a, what's called a complaint. You'll review the complaint, you'll go back with any changes that need to be done, and then the complaint comes back to you for signature. At that point, you sign it and you wait. And the idea is it'll probably be three or four months. 
um, and then you'll get a, a contact back and th they'll tell you that they're now the investigator and they're going to go ahead and investigate the claim on your behalf. So that investigator will review the documentation, probably ask for some additional evidence and any contacts and they will contact um, the employee and then they'll also contact the employer and they'll go through this investigative process. Now, I will tell you in a recent case I was dealing with, in fact, today was part of that case. It, the case was filed in July of last year. DFEH has one year from the date of filing to uh, make a decision. So is is filed in, in July. By September, the agency had decided that um, that they were going to assign somebody who quite honestly didn't know where the sky was. They did an interview. All the data was factually incorrect. The individual responded multiple times asking for just a correction on the complaint so that they could sign it and corrections were never made. In fact, the um, the person drafting the complaint apparently got fed up because she just didn't respond anymore. She kept asking what needs to be changed. It was very clear in the response and the highlights. And finally, she just re stopped responding. And then a few months later, the individual got a hold of a supervisor to find out what's going on. This person won't respond. The complaint doesn't seem. And they were told that they were closed for being non-responsive. And so that supervisor told them that they would handle it, went on vacation. Another supervisor then stepped in two months later, finally completed the complaint. But again, we have this, this hard stop of one year. So because that individual was not competent in their role and the file sat in a closed status without moving forward, even though there was sufficient evidence to reopen the status and finally get attention of somebody higher up to handle that, the clock stick kept ticking. So all the, the investigation would have started back in September. Again, it's now May. So we're looking at, you know, eight months later. And now we only have two months until the year is up. So DFEH um, has accepted this for investigation. If they only have two months and they're backlogged, what will happen is they're just going to issue their standard template anyways. So whether or not they do an investigation, they have a standard template that they release at the end of it. And the standard template will say something like um, uh, DFEH has completed their investigation. We do not find, um, we are not, we, we do not find there's sufficient information to back the merits of the case. We are thus not pursuing further and we release a right to sue. They do not issue le le letters that state DFEH has completed their investigation. We do find sufficient evidence, but we are not um, continuing a right to sue. Even if that's the case, as I talked to one of the um, appeal attorneys within DFEH, I was told that they only give the former sentence. It is a template that would have gone out to 21,996 of those individuals. And and, um, and and she said in the case that she was reviewing on our behalf that, in fact, there was more than sufficient evidence. The labor laws had been violated and um, she went she went through each line that she measures in the metrics for whether or not this could move forward. And she said, but the reality is we're, we're just not moving cases forward. It doesn't matter if it is or isn't. But out of that, there's ramifications for an agency picking up a job, pretending that they're making a difference, and then um, essentially lying at the end. It, it, this is really dishonest at the best. And I think this is very important in cancel culture, what we're seeing with companies canceling individuals, um, um, not only as jobs, but social media, you know, it goes right up in alignment with everything we're seeing in this country right now. But there's ramifications for this organization saying that they didn't find merits as a template and uh, mailing it out. In this case that I'm specifically referring to, it had been identified that, there were, that the merits were valid and there was substantial evidence in order to back it. However, there just weren't resources in the organization to move forward. And so uh, they, they would not. But the next comment was very interesting. They asked the employer if the employer would like to settle. The employer said no. And so that's the end of the conversation. There's no enforcement here. EEOC, DFEH, DOL. It's kind of like an honor system. 
if you are caught being bad, be worse. Because these companies have such deep pockets, they know the system, they know that these government agencies are overrun, and they know that even for the very, very small percent of an individual who is stupid enough to file in the system, as far as they're concerned, that um, it's very few are going to whittle down to them. And as long as they say no, these agencies will not take it to the next step. And so there's no penalty whatsoever. So let's, let's continue on this path. So that's the one issue. The second is by issuing a lie, which is a case has no merits, when in fact that it does, who does that go to? That goes to the individual who filed, but that actually also goes to the company who was on, on the defendant side of the investigation. So they get this letter and they think, oh good, we did nothing wrong. And it's usually not that individual. They're thinking, oh, good, that one employee didn't do anything wrong. We're good. We don't have to change anything. That's not the end of it. That's not the worst part. The next step is, let's say that now you have a right to sue. So you've gotten this letter. It's gone through the investigation, which was just an absolute facade. And and so you get this letter right to sue and now you go ahead and take it to court. So you can take it to court on your own, which we'll look at in a minute, or of course you can find an attorney. Good luck finding an attorney though, if especially in Silicon Valley, they tell you to either look in Los Angeles or in another state for individual to support you because in Silicon Valley, there are such a high percentage of high earners that are um, FTE, which are full-time equivalent, the actual employees, not contractors or vendors. So making very, very large salaries with benefits, but what lawyers really want are the employee stock options. So if they can't see that there's enough of a golden bucket at the end of the rainbow, then they're just going to um, give you a business decision and they'll be frank about it and say, look, you've got the merits, you've got the evidence, you're well organized, you're very professional, you are the type of applicant we like, except for from a business description decision, there's not enough um, money in order to cover the costs of our offices or to cover our costs. And they'll be real about that, that yes, you can go forward, but we can't pick it up. So who does? You're back to the same quality attorneys that would have worked for DFEH or EEOC that aren't worth their salt up against attorneys that work at, let's say, a Google or Facebook or Instagram that are paid millions of dollars a, a year just to be right. They're, they're not right. They're just persuading somebody in the direction so they can stand there and say they're better than somebody else. And in fact, then they continue to knock down the little guy. So those are the routes that you take. And that's the ramification of going through the DFEH and EEOC process. So what do you do? Not stand up for yourself? No. If there is something wrong and work has become a contact sport, understand that work has rules, whether this is for yourself, your spouse, a neighbor, a child, a friend, people have got to start standing up. And this is one fair way to do it because you're not out there fighting with your employee. You come home to your computer, you type a letter, you speak to them on the phone, they do an investigation, it's at least documented. And as long as you get more and more documentation, eventually there's gonna be a tipping point. And we're going to see a tipping point from the Capitol to the White House all the way down. We're going to have that day. But if everybody stays quiet, then life changes in a different direction. And we're not going to like the world that, lives in, that we live in. So at least take a moment, understand what these processes are, and go through the steps. But keep your eyes wide open through the process. They are ridiculous. They are underfunded. And they are actually meant to make it worse as far as I'm concerned. I did talk about the false right to sue based on no merits of the case, even when there are. But it also creates an emotional roller coaster. And for somebody who has been discriminated or harassed or removed from their job, the last thing they need is to go through more of a discrimination point. But this is something that you can do by yourself without an attorney, get drafted, at least get in the system, and you kick the can a little bit further down the road until you have the, the mental strength or the money or the, um, the oomph in order to take that next step. Um, so, so I wanted to show, here's employment discrimination. Let's see if it shows on here. 
Okay, yeah, this is what I was looking for. What employment discrimination looks like. These state laws barring discrimination applying to business practices, including advertisements, application screening and interviews, hiring, transferring, promoting, terminating, or separating employees, working conditions, including compensation, participation, participation in a training or apprenticeship program, employee organization, or union. The Fair Employment and Housing Act, FIHA, applies to public and private employers, labor organizations, and employment agencies. It is illegal for employers of five or more employees to discriminate against job applicants and employees because of a protected category or retaliate against them because they have asserted their rights under law. The FIHA it prohibits a harassment based on protected category against an employee, an applicant, an unpaid intern or volunteer or a contractor. Harassment is prohibited in all workplaces, even those with fewer than five people. California Family Rights Act, that CFRA, requires employers of five or more employees to provide an eligible employee with job protected leave to care for child, spouse, domestic partner, parent, grandparent, grandchild, or sibling with a serious health condition and for the employee's own serious health condition. Employers of five or more employees, employee, yeah, employees must provide up to four months of disability leave for an employee who is disabled due to pregnancy, childbirth, or related condition. And employers of five or more employees are required to provide sexual harassment training to supervisory and non-supervisory employees. And DFEH accepts complaints when a person believes that employer has not complied with these training and education requirements. So it, it goes a little bit into, um, to that section here is what is protected, race, color, creed, um, age. So here's your list, medical condition, marital status, and available remedies. These are some things that you can ask for, back pay, front pay, hiring, promotion, out of pocket, expenses, policy changes, training, reasonable accommodations, damages for emotional stress, punitive damages, and attorney's fees. So I'm going to pause here. I participated in a mediation today through DFEH. Mediations right now are done in a, a Zoom scenario where um, one side never meets with the other. So they come into a, a prearranged meeting room and then there's breakout rooms associated. And once you're put in that breakout room, the mediator will bounce back and forth, but they'll typically um, send a text or something before they even step into the room so that there is a level that if you do have an attorney with you in that room, you have um, a level of confidence for privacy. Oh, so uh, today uh, the uh, complaint had been discriminated against and harassed. Um, it was pretty deep. Um, however, this individual was very, very sharp. She had watched this happen to other people. So by the second time it had happened to her, she already went to an attorney, drafted a letter. She sent it in her own email. So it was it was firm and um, solid, but it wasn't like, here's my attorney attacking you. It was like, hey, I'm aware, work has rules. Here's the line in the sand. Well, about 30 days after that, um, she was completely removed from her job, removed, uh, demoted in pay and put to back um, all the way down to the most entry level position that the company had. And they seemed to think that this was okay. Um, after a period of time, there was some leave that had to occur due to extreme emotional distress um, to the situation. And they never let the, the individual come back. In fact, they kept saying that they had a position for her and they communicated often. So it made it look like there's a paper trail of they did all they could to bend over backwards for this individual. When the truth was the position that they offered her, they didn't really offer her. They said, you'll be doing this job, but it won't actually be this job. And you can't actually do that job unless you complete a training that we're not offering now. So you cannot do the job until this, but, but we're offering you this job. So if you want it, you can have it. And, and so over and over this went in circles and circles where there was no job, but because they kept communicating, it looked like they were this great employer bending over backwards. Well, meanwhile, furloughs hit due to COVID 
and of other companies, not this one, but they decided that she would know the difference. So let's go ahead and furlough her. So they changed her status to furlough and the, the tools that they did were still all around town. So it was very clear that they had not furloughed their staff. In fact, this individual had worked there, meaning she worked with peers and had friends and reached out to friends in three different departments and found out that yes, they're still working, they're not furloughed. And yet the employer maintained that, that status. Well, along the line, the employer had missed a pay um, early on when they were discriminating. So she had waited a full year and then gone ahead and filed for those missing wages, which were very nominal, a few hundred bucks. But she went ahead and filed that and her time came up. So it now been a year and a half and it was her time to, to have um, conversation with the Department of Labor in this case for those wages. So Department of Labor went ahead and took her claim, contacted the employer and asked, um, you know, it, they wanted to do what's called a, I think it's summary hearing. And uh, the employer denied they did not want to participate in that. They just wanted to make a payment. So they asked how much and they wrote a check. Again, a couple hundred bucks, no big deal. Uh, immediately thereafter, they retaliated because this is a protected activity of, um, of getting involved a government agency to look into an issue, whether it had swayed right or wrong, or there was a payment or not, didn't matter. But they were now notified that this individual had reached out to a government agency because of problems that they believed might exist. So she was now protected. However, within a few days, she was fired from that position. However, uh, DFEH, uh, during the, the mediation, informed her that no, none of this counts. There's, you can't get back pay, you can't get front pay. That's ridiculous. There's no hiring and reinstatement. Um, Out-of-pocket expenses are your responsibility. Uh, training, you don't have to do that, even though that was the demand in the, the um, return to work order. Uh, reasonable accommodations were being requested here, and it was just uh, give her a safe environment and not have her report to the individual who had just harassed and retaliated and removed her from her job, and that was denied. So uh, damages for emotional stress uh, were certainly off the table, even though you better believe um, deep PTSD came from this, and you might say, really, come on. I'm a veteran, PTSD. Yes, PTSD in the workplace has gotten very severe when work is a contact sport. It, it, it is, well, if we liken this to, there, we, we've all studied codependency. And, and so codependency is usually likened to usually a, a relationship with, with um, a loved one. And one person looks to the other, they're reliant on the other for money or shelter or, or something. And then there's games played and manipulation and often in retaliation, the support is taken away. Well, you can imagine this is thousands of times worse in many cases in the employer employee relationship because an employee goes and you can call it what you want applies for, but essentially begs for a job, is granted the right to show up every day and serve for an often a pittance or minimum wage and so if they step out of line in any reason, they are caught being bad rather than caught being good and rewarded. And so it's one system after another of beating people down. The emotional stress really ties on that. So now somebody goes year after year truly trying to please their employer just to keep their job, forget the notion of climbing a career ladder, but just maybe as a single mom or a single dad or a, a sole wage earner, just to have some level of consistency of making sure they have the money to put on the table. The emotional stress is serious as that's ripped away and threatened on a daily basis. And then of course there's punitive damages and attorney fees. But I don't know where this list goes because after going through several investigation proceedings uh, with, with others and also the mediation today, somehow all of this seems to go out the table and even the mediators themselves sway away from from um, any kind of resolution on here and just ask for the other side. Do you want to settle? They say no. In fact, today the settlement should have been um, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
And the, the employer came back without even acting in good faith whatsoever and said uh, 750 bucks. And we had to clarify that that's what they were offering because that was just inexcusable for what this individual had gone through for two and a half years. And uh, they say, yep, 750 bucks. So you know they had no intention of settling. And now this case will be going to court where the individual will have um, a, a better chance. And the other side will pay dearly in, in uh, employment fees just to be right. So here we have US EEOC Commission. You know, they run about the same. They're a very small shop each, uh, again, federally funded. However, um, they're, each organization that supports an area would be located in each state. You know, they have the same basic protected employment, um, protected classes, and the same, it's, it's just like a sister agency back and forth. Um, they protect for retaliation and, and punishment, just like the other classes. Um, it, it's just, you know, one direction or another depends on who the administrator is and who's running it and how far you can get in the process based on whether or not it's fair during the, the time period. So here we have DOL. Again, this is Department of Labor known as DLSE or DIR or whatever else they want to throw at it, but essentially it's um, the labor code. And this goes back to work has rules. Filing or threatening to file a claim or complaint with the labor commissioner is an example of a protected activity. So all you have to do is say that I don't think this is right. I'm going to file a claim and you are protected as long as you have documentation that that happened. Taking time off of work to serve on a jury or appear as a witness is a protected activity. Disclosing or discussing your wages for many, many decades, employers have told employees they cannot discuss their wages. Yes, you can, because the more you know, the more you know how to leverage and negotiate and who's being paid fairly and who is not. Using or attempting to use sick leave to attend to the illness of a child, parent, spouse, domestic partner is also a protected activity. So as you work through and you realize work isn't fun or uh, this didn't feel right today, or, you know, there's something more going on here. You know, there, there's a lot that we just let roll off our backs, but there's a certain point where we have to draw the line in the sand. If you've set up a career, you've got your education, you, you're in this path where you're serving another country and it's slavery, no matter how you want to call it, then you're relying on that consistency in order to support your family. The number one case, um, the reason for divorce has always been financial challenges. And the number one um, contributor to financial challenges is work income, right? Income from work. And when that is messed with or manipulated or the, even the worry of possibly losing your job due to a threat in the company, that ripples on into fear and looking over your back and it, 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 it snowballs really fast in relationships. So here we have workplace guidelines. Work rules should be necessary. Is there a need for a clearly defined written work set? Are they reasonable in compliance with existing policy contracts and laws, beneficial to your employees as they conduct um, the department's business, are they clear? There should be no question about the intent of language. You know, there's, there's one thing that's really being used right now is called a performance improvement plan. Just pulling that up right here. I just spelled that wrong. So, you know, I didn't uh, grab this in advance, but essentially a performance improvement plan is a document that is usually sent between a, a manager or supervisor and an employee. And typically, it, it, well, it's never because, hey, you're doing a great job. Let's help you boost on the ladder a little bit long, a little higher. It's always, we caught you doing something wrong. We're writing you up. And the way to do that now is a, a PIP, a performance improvement plan. The performance improvement plan typically has three areas. One is establishing what the individual did wrong, because again, this is a cut you doing wrong. The second is establishing um, what the employer would like in the area of correction. So what behavior do they want to see or action or benchmark or numbers hit or 
whatever that is in the second category. And the third is how are we going to measure this? And this is really important to the success of number two, because if the person isn't clear on what's being requested in number two, and there isn't a clear measurement that is not subjective, but objective. So subjective means that, um, hey, I think you did a good job. I don't have anything to measure it against, but I'm going to give you a thumbs up. Object is on a scale of one to 10, when you, um, let's say when you started your laptop this morning, you had 10 minutes to get it up and running and, um, and install the new software. You got it done in eight minutes. So I'm going to give you a nine today because that, that beat our um, expectations. But I did see that in the process, um, you did have to look up some resources. So next time I would like you to have it memorized so you can get the 10. Um, but other than that, it was great. So that's an objective measurement of, you know, more or less, you would have the rules up front and what the metrics and you you'd throw it in there. So there's something there and the individual knows, okay, tomorrow I've, I've done everything right, getting the laptop up and set the, the computer on the software. Tonight, I'm gonna work on memorizing that or maybe a brief cue card with the steps that I might forget so I can I can have that handled right there in front of me and show that I, I listened, I responded and I grew. So there's a benchmark. And so again, you have, uh, what was the error? or the action um, that was not liked, what is the behavioral correction and what is the measurement for that correction? There's also a timeline by which date would that be corrected? What we're seeing is PIPs being used as an intimidation tactic and PIPs are insufficient. So it won't even tell the employee what they did wrong in fact, further investigations in HR will still not hold that information and the managers don't actually know how to use a PIP. So they'll issue a PIP and the individual will now have extreme stress because they know they're in trouble. They don't know what they did wrong. They're now told to correct their behavior. But in most cases, employers don't have that next step. So they won't even put a behavioral correction there or to be so vague, it'll be something like make a happy work environment. But the individual thinks that's what I do every day. And then there's no measurement rubric because most individuals um, in management are, are bumped into that area without management training and this don't know how to handle that. They're simple tools, doesn't take much for anybody to learn. It's just a matter of putting time into that. And so on the way out the door, these PIPs are used and they're really used uh, to um, CYA HR or a supervisor. And, and it comes to backstabbing is what it does in many cases, rather than a helpful tool. So an employee that's wise would approach this and say, yes, I'm open to coaching. And here's the three areas. I, they're not clear to me. Can we work through to see what we can do to make this clear? I'll take this again as coaching and benchmarks forward. And by the way, on the way out of this, what career path can I also build within a training model so that as other job opportunities open, I could always be set in that direction. But that's not usually what happens because employers don't want to work with the employee. They just want to have it documented. So the reason this is so important right now, oh, I wanted to step on this before we, we went in. This is the one last here before we close out on the next slide. Um, do you have to have an attorney? Through the DFEH, EEOC, and DOL process, I actually say no and do not. Now you can certainly consult with attorney. There's different programs like Legal Shield or community organizations that give free legal aid. And I say 100% yes, but do not tell a government agency or for that matter, a credit bureau or any of those that you have an attorney representing you. It's not to be deceiving or lying or messing it up, but unless the attorney has actually signed a document stating they're representing you in this case to the point of settlement, you really don't have an, an attorney representing you. But the reason why it's so important not to identify that with EEOC, DHE, um, D, DFEH, or DOL is once they hear the words attorney, then they will not talk to you anymore. They say it's a professional courtesy, which they don't even know the rule. Even when you present to them the rule that you're allowed to work with an attorney, they lock you out. And again, that clock is ticking. So they'll lock you out. You don't get forward in your case. 
and then they'll only communicate with an attorney. Now the attorney might not be available. It might slide through the cracks and you don't know they've reached out to them and they didn't respond. And that's too bad because you've missed your case. The attorney does not have your best interest in mind because in, in most cases, it's so little money, they're gonna go for the big dollars or they're too scattered with all the work they have on the desk as a community organizer that they just don't have you in your home suffering because you don't have a job or looking over your back every day is not their problem. So you representing yourself, saying your own case, but getting the advice of an attorney along the way is really the best hybrid. Now, if you have to take it to court, unfortunately, we're always told that only stupid people go to court without an attorney. And you know what? That might be so. But I don't know on what planet because I think only stupid people accept a cancel culture, get fired from a job and don't stand up for themselves. So if you don't have an attorney and you have a case and evidence, then stand up for yourself, walk on down to the superior court and file a claim. If you need help along the way, again, get the coaching of attorneys. And if you're blessed to have an attorney that will work with you, then that's awesome. Most of them in this arena will actually work on contingency. It's just a matter of getting one that will actually work with you. And in many cases, we just can't. There's not enough attorneys. And there's, there's a lot of cases because there's a, a lot of discrimination. So just like I mentioned early on, like every business owner, you're gonna pick and choose based on a business decision. No matter how strong the case is or how much you like the individual, you're running a business. And, and so if you can't get a lawyer, you are a smart individual. Stand up for yourself, learn the law, learn the case, and walk forward. What's the worst that can happen? The legal fees are not that hard, um, high in order to file with the court system. They're meant to be a court um, for the people. You are going to have um, dispositions, you know, there's different uh, checkpoints that are routine that, um, that you can just figure out on the way. And then you stand in front of the judge. And let me point out again, most judges in California are not judges. They're administrative hearing officers. And that means they don't actually make a decision. They take, they listen to the the I'd say facts, but the last place you ever find the facts are in a courtroom. They listen to the documents that have often been doctored on the employer side, as I've seen, where the other person stands there as honest as can be, trying to present their case. Um, so they they take the information, and then they pretty much go back and say, okay, how do you guys want to settle this? And then um, at some point they'll they'll enter a ruling. Uh, but what you'll do is you'll learn in the process. And the next time this happens to you, and I guarantee it will, if you're awake and you realize this happened once, this is happening more and more often. You'll either be able to help somebody else or you can help yourself because you can go a little bit further down that field next time. So it's so important. They don't teach this in school, but you need to learn how to run your own business and you need to know how to stand up for yourself when you're wronged. So let's go ahead and close this out. This is, this is the push for what I'm saying today. And I've, I've already let you know, there's America's um, frontline doctors. Let's see, doctors. Um, AFLGS, and their site is right here. They're a, really a, a grassroots that became a national organization that they, there's a, um, I guess they just had that this weekend, uh, Uncensored Truth Tour. But what they do is they are, are standing up for individuals based on the constitution. You have a right as a citizen of this country. And so if you are being discriminated against, whether you are being forced to use this experimental system, again, it has not even been approved by the FDA. It is an experiment, uh, then, they'll step in on your behalf or you're being forced to wear a mask or not go to work, they'll step in on your behalf. So they have legal resources here that you can file and they'll start sending letters and they're hoping that those letters, if not complied with, they're gonna start launching, launching 
nationwide as many lawsuits as they possibly can. They all have to be centered around the Constitution and they all have to be centered around this cooties issue. They're primarily stopping universities from having uh, people attend school if they don't have the, the V word and uh, the mask because they're also stopping the scarlet letter. So on the flip side, if you choose not to do that and you are removed, or you choose not to do that and you're allowed to stay, but you have to wear a scarlet letter in order to pre be there, that is a violation of a number of, of, um, of wartime laws that we have in place uh, to protect us. So we've got on that, we've got great information. Of course, uh, Dr. Simone Gold is a doctor in Southern California. She's um, an MD and also an attorney and she's really leading um, this. She has here 10 facts regarding the Cooties experimental um, V in case you want to download that. There's just a wealth of information here to educate yourself and your rights and how to get help. So here, right in the center, if you are um, participating in any of these activities and you need legal help, you can click here in the middle. And what you do is you file a claim, somebody will contact you and they'll draft a letter. And then if there isn't action, then they will reach out for a plaintiff in the case. If you want to be the plaintiff, then they start with the suits from there. Over here on the right, we have Citizen Corps. If you would like to go ahead and stand up in your community and start supporting the Constitution, specifically around the issue of cooties in universities, jobs, and elementary schools. And then over on the left here, we've got medical. These are uh, doctors primarily located, you guessed it, outside the states of California and New York, and you can call them through a telemedicine appointment. The appointment is about, I think it's $90, I don't know for sure, but it's meant to be nominal. It's actually a third party, it's not AFLDS, but they've um, tied them in here so that people can get help. So if you need a mask exemption or, or more in this arena, you would contact them and they would evaluate you. And if in fact they determine that it's hazardous to your health in order to wear a mask that has you breathe out and breathe in your own bad air over and over again through the day, we know this is a link to cancer. But in many situations, it is um, immediately more dangerous as well. So if, if you need help there, then that is available. And all of this is very much encouraged and um, the legal I is, is free if you file that and the medical is just the fee for the telemedicine um, appointments. And then of course the prescription. Oh, if you need any prescriptions, they have, um, they'll write prescriptions for the medications other than the V for the cooties and um, hydrochloroquine is one of them. Um, it's been proven for decades. It's, uh, so anyways, they'll go through those options if that's the need. So again, let's go back to this and why I'm bringing this up. This is April 30th, 2021. So this was a few weeks ago. This really slid under the radar for most people. This was from mayorbrown.com and it's entitled California DFEH. Now remember, I just pointed out DFEH. This is Department of Fair Employment of Housing Guidance on Workplace Vaccination Policy. This is by Ruth and Sean. On March 4th, 2021, the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing DFEH issued updated guidance on CUTI's 19 related topics in a document titled DFEH Employment Information on Cooties FAC, and you can click, click on that if you want it. In this current guidance, the DFEH made clear that under the California uh, FE, California Fair Employment and Housing Act, FEHA, employers may require employees to receive an FDA approved. So apparently we're not there yet because they're not approved, but there's a lot of misunderstanding around that. In fact, yesterday I got a, a an email from my school's, um, my child's school district that says they're now going to start um, putting the jab into 12 year old, 12 and up. And so hurry up and make your appointment so you can return to school in August. It's not even approved yet. But um, okay, to receive the FDA approved um, V infection, so long as the employer does not discriminate against or harass employees or job applicants on the basis of a protected characteristic. The guidance is consistent with the guidance issued by the U.S. 
EEOC commission. So you got both agency double doubling this on December 16, 2020, which Mayor Brown previously discussed here. So you can click there. Below, we highlight the critical elements of DFEH's um, guidance. Employers may require employees to be vaccinated against cooties. The guidance provides that an employer may require employees to receive an FDA approved vaccination against C so long as the employer does not discriminate against or harass employees or job applicants on the basis of protected class. So if they don't harass you because you're a girl or older or protected, then they can require that you have to be jabbed. Provides reasonable accommodations related to disability or sincerely. So as long as they're doing these other things, then they can still give you the jab. Does not retaliate against anyone for engaging in a protective activity. Again, as long as you don't break the other rules they have, they can still require that you do this. In explaining DFEH's rationale, the guidance states that the US um, Food and Drug Administration authorized and recommended three Vs against C, cooties infection, it's an infection, huh? And the FDA may approve other Vs for use in the United States. Um, when has the FDA approved this? It is not approved and people need to understand that. It is still experimental. The DFEH does not address the fact that the three Vs referenced have received um, emergency use only authorization. Okay, again, so here it's clarifying it rather than the full FDA approval. Accordingly, it's not clear whether the guidance permitting employers to implement mandatory vaccine, I'm sorry, V policies applies with uh, respect to the Vs that have been authorized and recommended under the EUA, but have not yet received FDA approval. To date, no C has received FDA approval. So it goes on further here. If in fact you wanna know more about uh, reasonable accommodations, um, it's here. But the fact is, whether or not this is unclear today, you've got a number of individuals that'll see EEOC and DFEH and assume that this is valid, even though it is not, and they will start forcing it. And the scarlet letter is worn by those who show up without a mask and are told that they have to leave and not be paid. Or, or worse, those who choose not to have this foreign su substance injected directly into their bloodstream will start losing their jobs over an emergency that use authorization that has not been approved by the FDA, but is being misled by both DFEH and EEOC. This is really crucial right now. Standing up for yourself in a, in a workplace, whether it's with DFEH, with EEOC, with DOL for wage labor um, uh, claims, you gotta stand up for yourself. This is not right, this is not normal. And as citizens as a free country right now, we have lost almost all our freedoms. I wish you luck. Here's my overview. Please, if this information doesn't fit you, you can celebrate, but help somebody else who's in need.